Cairo, Seattle. is your last meal. I'm your host, Rachel Bell, and every episode I interview a celebrity about what they would choose to eat for their last meal. Then we explore the history of that food, the culture, and whatever else we can cram into 30 minutes. Today on the program, astrophysicist, author, director of the Hayden Planetarium in New York City, and host of the science, pop culture, and comedy radio program, Star Talk. It's <sighs> quite a title. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Hello, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Hello, I'm back. Wow, you sound much deeper. That was like a Barry White right there. <laughs> you called before. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Barry White. <yeah. laughs> we'll chat about his new book, his love of melted butter, and, you know, no big deal, the time he almost became a stripper. I also chat with former NASA astronaut Mike Massimino about what it's like to eat in outer space. And, little tip from me to you, if you ever chat with Mike Massimino, don't ever, ever assume there's no stake in space. Sure there's stake in space. There Who is? Who told you there's no stake in space? I don't know. I just made it up. I assumed there wasn't stake in space. How many times did you eat steak in this space? This is what happens when you assume. This is fake no, we news. Have, have, of course we have, we have, we have steak. <laughs> Plus, the rags to riches story of lobster. You know, it wasn't always the fancy schmancy food it is today. But first, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So I want to talk about how you got to where you are today in astronomy. Um, I read that you grew up in New York City. You still live in New York City. And the thing that I love is that you went to Hayden Planetarium when you were a little kid, I think nine years old. And yeah, now yeah. you are the director of this planetarium, which is amazing. Uh, when did you realize that you were fascinated with astronomy? Yeah, yeah. So at age nine, it was the first visit to the Hayden Planetarium. It was an indelible encounter. It, I was starstruck, right, physically and emotionally and literally and, yeah 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 and it would take a couple of years before i learned that you could make a career out of this but i'd say by 11 i had an answer to that annoying question that adults always ask kids you know what do you want to be when you grow up the answer is astrophysicist so last night I was watching my friend's seven-year-old Isa, and I asked her what she wanted to be when she grew up and she literally sighed rolled her eyes at me and said why do adults always ask me that so adults, let's find a new question. <laughs> I think that we can do it. Anyway, back to Neil. By the time you were in high school, you already met Carl Sagan. Is that correct? Well, yeah. I, I, as, a, as a senior in high school, I met him just once on his invitation to visit the Cornell campus. He prof was professor of astronomy at Cornell University, and I was, had applied there to go to college and I didn't know that they had sent my application to him for his comment and reflection. And that that ended up with him sending me a letter of invitation to to check out the camp, which was I thought was an astonishing act it is. of generosity. Just astonishing. Because who am I'm nobody. He was already there was pre Cosmos, but he was already famous, having made appearances, multiple appearances on the Tonight Show, cover articles for Parade magazine. These are places that were not traditional outposts for science communication. And he was heavily criticized by many people. You're going to go on Johnny Carson? That's comedy. Science has no place. You got really stuffed shirts who could not even wrap their head around this. Uh, and the, at the end of the day, he's reaching millions of people with his charisma and his, his own curated offering of the universe would end up triggering immense interest by the public in, in science in general, but in exploration in particular. And then if you're, if you're a scientist and you want previously grumbling about whatever Carl Sagan was doing or saying, and then <laughs> the a member of Congress of your district says, oh, your, is, your lab is doing this other stuff. I just saw a thing on that with Carl Sagan. Oh, let's up the funding. For <laughs> so all the, t the tide waters rose across the spectrum of the sciences when this happened. And so uh, we owe him a great debt for even having the vision to step out of the lab into the public in this way. 
Well, that's what you've done. I mean, you are a celebrity astrophysicist, which isn't something you hear about very often. And, you know, the only time I've seen you live, it was with Eugene Merman and other comedians on a stage in Seattle. I read that you said, I already knew I wanted to become a scientist. But that afternoon that you met Carl Sagan, I learned from Carl the kind of person I wanted to become. Does that have to do with the route that you took to kind of bring comedy and entertainment into the realm of science and astronomy to get people excited about it? Oh, no, no, not at all. It's, 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 so that, that quote is accurate, but it comes across loftier than its intent. So the intent is, here is an extremely famous person giving time of his day in the service of someone who is coming after him with ambitions that overlap his. Because I remember thinking, I'm 17 years old, and this is going through my head. If I'm ever remotely as famous as Carl Sagan, I will give time to students who are rising up and wanting to become a scientist the way Carl Sagan has done for me. It's, it's, it's a level of access that he has provided, which in the big picture is kind of the passing of a torch or the sharing of a torch with others because science is a highly collaborative uh, enterprise and it requires that a whole next generation rise up, fresh energy, fresh perspectives. So over the years that followed, as my visibility grew and the, the celebrity factor grew, and it is weird to have celebrity and astrophysicist in the same sentence. That is weird. I, um, I, I don't know that I'll ever grow fully accustomed to that. But it, it's an awesome responsibility to occupy that mantle. And I, I do so uh, willingly but humbly. This is my favorite thing that I found when I was doing research on you, was that you actually considered briefly becoming an exotic dancer. Oh, <laughs> it was very briefly, very, I'm embarrassed that I thought that way at all because I was, I was strapped for cash in graduate school and I probably could have avoided it if I had gotten a roommate and then you pay half the rent, but I valued sort of living alone, but that then cost me, right? And so uh, I was barely making ends meet and I was a performing member of a dance troupe and yeah, some guys said, why don't you come down and get some extra cash, uh, you know, in your, in your G string. Right. And I said, well, I guess I was particularly flexible at the time and, um, uh, pretty physically fit. I, I could do a full split just as an example. So I thought, yeah, I could probably do this. And that's when I noticed, no, I, I can tutor math when, <laughs> when they started, when they came out. A lateral with, move. <laughs> a very lateral move <laughs> when they when they came out dancing with their jockstrap on fire to Jerry Lee Lewis's great balls of fire and and maybe it was the flame that just watching their their genitals on fire so maybe it, that's what it took but it shouldn't have taken that as far as I'm concerned I should have been able to figure this out because of course I can teach I can tutor mathematics and it's reliable income and everybody needs a math tutor so that's what I ultimately did you could have combined the two you could have had a flaming jock strap while tutoring someone in math you know I wasn't that creative at the time <laughs> <laughs> Is it true that you're the one that kind of started the conversation uh, for converting Pluto from a true planet to a dwarf planet? Well, yeah, it was no, it was in the air professionally, but at my institution, we were the first to reorganize what Pluto's identity was from being a full red-blooded planet uh, associated with the other eight to associating it with dirty, frozen ice balls in the outer solar system. In the newly opened Rose Center for Earth and Space, in the year 2000. And we were early out of the box doing that. And But because we were the first out of the box, yeah, we, we just got raked over the coals. It, it would take a year for it, hit, it to hit the New York Times, but it hit. And that's when they, the, the headline was, Pluto not a planet, only in New York. So that implicated New York, it implicated my institution, it implicated me, and, and the, the hate mail started coming in from third graders. <laughs> you know, complaining uh, it was with crayon scrawled messages. And so, yeah, I became public enemy for doing that. But then six years later, there was a vote uh, in the international astrophysics community to downgrade Pluto to a dwarf planet status. And that took some of the pressure off me. But and every now and then, people with long memories uh, will make a face as they walk by me on the street. Did you shred all those evil crayon messages? <laughs> no, I still have them, but my favorite, <laughs> my favorite 
was uh, I got a letter from someone who was 21 who said, this is like a few years ago, 21. It said, this letter is as deadpan as can be. It says, dear Dr. Tyson, over the years, I began to research your claim that Pluto should be a dwarf planet. And I've come to agree after evaluating the evidence that you were right all along. So I want to express my deepest apologies in a letter I wrote to you when I was eight years old, in which I called you a poo-poo head. What? <laughs> <laughs> a formal apology. Was this one typewritten? Um, so yes, this was this was a formal typewritten apology. That's amazing. And so now I got to find a poo poo head letter, <laughs> just mixed within all the other hate mail that I've gotten. Yeah, you have to frame them side by side. Put them side by side, right? You may have noticed that we haven't even gotten to the food talk yet. <sighs> just so much to talk about. We're going to take a quick break. And when we return, Neil deGrasse Tyson's last meal. We're back with astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson going to say his name more than I've said anyone's name in any other episode. N, little d, big G, big T. If you could only have one thing, what would your last meal be? My last meal? I would depend on why it was my last meal. If I was being executed, I wouldn't be distracted eating. I would try to find a way to escape. <laughs> so you have maybe any like skills? Well, all you have to do is be smarter than the person who's decided your fate. And if you're smarter than they are, you might be able to outwit them. So I'm never as responsive or cooperative in questions such as, you only have this one chance, what will it be? I like thinking that I can be clever enough to have more options than what you are supplying for me. But if, if, you, if I must play along. Yes. <laughs> Just this once. <laughs> if I must play along. I think I would have uh, lobster with a lot of butter for several reasons because it takes a really long time to fully eat a lobster. The sooner I finish the meal, the sooner you'll end up killing me, presumably because it's my last meal. So I get all the meat out of all the mini legs of the lobster, and that takes a long time. So I'll just sit there and savor this last meal. Plus, lobster is really a, a, a means of consuming a melted butter, right? It's just one of several ways you, you get to do that. So I would have lobster with a nice bottle of, what would it be? I'd say a aged Montrachet from Burgundy. You are a celebrity astrophysicist, lobster, and I don't even know what that drink is. Is this a fancy <laughs> wine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an aged Montrachet. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a white Burgundy wine. Okay, and and it's uh, and if they're if they're paying, then why not, right? Uh, it's a it's a kind of expensive, high highly complex white wine. When you eat lobster, do you wear the bib? And if it's my last meal, I don't think that would be necessary. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's like for lethal injection where they swab your arm with alcohol before they inject you. It's like, yeah, and your point of doing that is <laughs> you wouldn't want to get an infection before you die. Before lobster became an expensive luxury food, its claws savagely cracked and its sweet meat slurped out by crustacean-craving fancy pants people, it was considered garbage food, like literal garbage. Barton Siever is a Maine-based, as in the state of Maine, Maine-based seafood chef and author of the cookbook for Cod and Country. He says from the time our country was founded through about the early 1800s, you literally couldn't pay people to eat lobster. Lobster in America was once really seen as, as food of the poor. Prisoners, poor people, uh, and really was, was looked down upon in terms of an ingredient. Indentured servants uh, brought a case in Massachusetts in which they demanded that their employers not feed them more than uh, two or three times a week. And uh, I think that law still stands on the books, though indentured servitude thankfully doesn't. That came about really because of its abundance. In the early days of the founding of, of this nation, you know, colonists found windrows of lobster piled up feet high after nor'easters would blow in uh, to the coast. Uh, you know, it was used as fertilizer, fodder for animal feed. And so it was really only the very poorest that ate lobster and did so with great embarrassment as it was sort of proof of one's economic status. Seaver says in the 1840s, lobster was one of the first foods to be commercially canned in America. And that went on until it was overfished and eventually replaced with sardines. 
and largely lobster fell from grace. But it was really, I think, around uh, 1900 or so when people began to visit the shore, uh, the rusticators, as they were called. And you know, lobster is both the epitome of luxury now, but it's also the epitome of provenance. And so when people eat lobster, they recall instantly a moment spent on the coast of Maine, the ragged, jagged, rocky, sexy, rustic coast, you know, the cool, salt, fragrant breeze blowing in off the ocean. Oh, gosh. I mean, everything is there. And so around the 1900s, once uh, these vacationers began to flood the sort of northern reaches of the East Coast, then it began to really gain its popularity sort of become the epitome of luxury. And lobster has had its ups and downs since then. So during the Great Depression, people could no longer afford it. And then in World War II, lobster was canned and sent overseas to the American troops. But by the late 1960s, early 1970s, it reached its peak price, which is double what we pay now for lobster. But in modern times, nothing goes with lobster like a diamond ring and a Cheddar Bay biscuit. Red Lobster. The chain of restaurants is actually one of the top places in America for marriage proposals because it is the fanciest food, sexiest food that most people have access to. And so that right there, I think, is one of the best commentaries on its stature in our culture now. I Googled that, couldn't find any facts on it, but I'd say we keep it because Barton Seaver said it and I think that it's a cool fact. I don't mean to cast aspersions to people who <laughs> maybe eat at chain restaurants uh -huh. or enjoy a Red Lobster, but what if what if somebody proposed to you at a Red Lobster? Only if they proposed to me with a lobster-shaped ring made entirely out of rubies. Or butter? Or butter. They just dip your finger in butter. I say yes. <laughs> yes, with a southern accent. <laughs> The question is, why do we love lobster so much? It's not a fishy fish. You know, I, I loathe to say this, but Americans are not seafood eaters, really. But when it comes to the, you know, actually eating it on the palate, man, that succulent, sweet, naturally buttery, rich flavor to it that is, is fragrant and aromatic with all the flavors of the sea, even giving off a whisper of vanilla scent that's incredibly versatile, too. Uh, we're so used to just eating lobsters, you know, with just a side of melted butter. But there's so many different ways to enjoy lobster. What is your favorite way to eat lobster currently? <laughs> uh, currently, I, I make a lobster pho, like the the Vietnamese noodle soup, you know, boiling down the the shells and the insides for a, a beautiful silken rich broth, and then just the meat sliced very thin and used as a garnish. That's kind of my favorite now. But a funny story, when my wife and I first moved uh, to Maine, you know, we had to stop eating lobster with melted butter because we just had this kind of permaglycin to our chins from all the melted butter that we had just from the lobsters. Oh, poor Barton Seaver. We're all crying melted butter tears for you and your never-ending supply of buttery lobster. But I guess that's just the way it is when you live on the coast of Maine, at least according to Barton. If you don't fish it yourself, then your neighbor does. For instance, my wife and I, we raise uh, chickens for eggs. You know, we just put eggs out on the front lawn and we get dropped off lobsters and the eggs are gone by the end of the day. So, yeah, it makes one of the cheapest and most convenient ways to eat dinner. Since we're discovering the last meal of astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, it only made sense to reach out to an actual astronaut who has blasted off into space to see what it's like eating at zero gravity. Is there a particular astronaut that you think would be good to get in touch with to talk about their experience eating in space, someone you know who's into that kind of thing? Oh yeah, there's tons, but let me give you one who has his memoir that just came out. Uh, he's a friend of Star Talk. Uh, he's really funny guy. Uh, honest and candid and friendly, all the stuff you'd want in your conversation. Is this Massimino? Yeah, Mike Massimino. That's yeah. who we wanted in the first place. And you tell him I sent you. Okay. Mike Massimino is producer Aaron's favorite astronaut. I always imagine that you have kind of like baseball cards, astronaut cards, <laughs> and you collect ones that have Mike Massimino's face on it. I think I did have some astronaut cards when I was a kid, Oh, honestly. so that exists? <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. Mike Massimino is not just producer Aaron's favorite astronaut. He also worked for NASA from 1996 to 2014, and both of his space shuttle missions were flying to the Hubble Space Telescope. 
Mike Massimino is a New York Times bestselling author of the memoir Spaceman. He's a professor of mechanical engineering at Columbia, and he's an advisor at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum in New York City. Oh, I'm hearing a little feedback on this. I'm eating lunch. That's probably the problem. (laughs) That could be. What are you eating? Tuna sandwich. You're not having tang and astronaut ice cream and other cliche, stereotypical things? Astronaut ice cream is disgusting. No astronaut would eat that. We have much better desserts than uh, that astronaut ice cream. It's like eating cardboard. Mike says the food in space is actually really good. Basically, what they're given are MREs, meals ready to eat. And some of the food is dehydrated and requires the addition of water. But unlike the MREs that are given to the military, this food is custom cooked and designed for the astronauts at NASA's food lab at Johnson Space Center. We have a food tasting session. A couple days throughout your training, you're going to go and have lunch as a crew at our food lab. And uh, you sit around this very nice table and they bring out samples of, of different foods that you can have in space and you rate them from zero to nine. Uh, so like shrimp cocktail, we would just, just about everyone would rate as a nine and maybe some kind of vegetables or something that you might not like as much, you might not give as high a rating. And then they take all of your information and the dietitian then tries to figure out what would be the best stuff for you to eat based on your preferences. Now you can't get all your preferences. You, know, you can't have macaroni and cheese at every meal. Uh, that's probably not good for you. So they have to give you enough calories, but also give you enough nutrition so that you have a balanced diet. So they'll try to take into consideration your preferences as best they can. And and then they'll, they'll map out what your meals are going to be, give you your menu, and give you all the food in your food locker that will correspond to the items on your, on your list. Uh, and that's the way it was on the shuttle program. That's the way it was on the space station program up until a few years ago. And now it's slightly different. They, they, they think that they're pretty familiar now with what people like to eat in space. And so you don't have your own set of food. It's kind of like a community uh, food locker that you go to and, and pick out what you're going to eat. So since you're away from home and you could be away for a while, uh, do comfort foods really factor in? Is that something that they think about? The psychology of food is really important, I think, as particularly in, in, in times when you're away from home or you're in a stressful situation. It's not only the food itself, but it's also the sharing of the meal. Some other astronauts before me, before my time, uh, flew on the Mir space station. And one of the things that we learned was that they had a table on the Mir space station. You really don't need a table for your food because your food floats and you can Velcro it to your leg or to the wall wall, you know, in between bites. All of our food has a little bit of consistency to it, a little bit of gravy or sauce or some some liquid to it so that because liquid keeps things together. You don't want crumbs because crumbs could cause problems. You can inhale them. They can get in your eye, stuff like that. So most of our food has some kind of liquidy sort of consistency to it, which is very good. So you know, you're not worried about you know, spilling things necessarily, but what they use the table for is a place to gather and have a crew meal together as if you're a family having a meal. And there's a comfort to that. And the food, good food is important. Having something good in your, in your tummy and also sharing a meal with your crewmates, with your, the people who you're out there with, really helps psychologically. And on long duration space trips, you really can't discount the importance of, uh, of good psychological well-being. It, it not only makes you feel better about what you're doing, but also improves performance. And food plays a huge role in it. Does food taste different in space? I know that there are studies that food can taste different when you're at a certain altitude in an airplane, that maybe you taste things that have an umami quality to them that taste better to people in an airplane. Do you notice that when you're up in space? What's going on in space is that you're in, uh, in zero gravity. When you're in space, your heart's still pumping, but the fluid is not being held in place by gravity. So it tends to pool in our upper extremities, upper body and into the head. So you get a little more congestion in your head. And some of that, the brain figures it out and redistributes it a little bit better. But still, you generally have a little more fluid in your head than you normally would. Because of that, Uh, you get a little stuffy, and because of that, you don't smell quite as well. And smelling uh, helps you enjoy your food. So you're not going to be able to taste as well because you're a little bit stuffed up when you're in space. We tend to like spicier food because we can taste it a little bit better. So Tabasco is a really important thing. Um, Salt and pepper is available, but not in a crystal form. It's actually in a liquid form. And uh, shrimp cocktail, as I said, is a very popular food, and that's because it comes with a very spicy horseradish, red sauce, 
That's part of my theory. It's not just because it's shrimp. I didn't know you could have salt and pepper in liquid form. That's really cool. Yeah, because the salt would be a real problem. That stuff would get sprayed around and certainly get in someone's eyes and, or you can inhale it or get inside your equipment, and that would be bad. And even though Mike hates astronaut ice cream, as you heard earlier, he says they do drink powdered tang up in space. Tang is a commercial product, so the government can't call it tang. You know, NASA's a government agency, so it's called orange-flavored drink. Hmm. So M&Ms are not M&Ms. They are uh, chocolate-coated candies. Is that so NASA isn't endorsing any products? That's correct. Huh. That's interesting. But I'm no longer with the government, so I can say that's what I drank. You can say M&Ms to your heart's delight. I can say M&Ms <laughs> and get away. Mike says he actually had a last meal experience of his own. On my first space flight, you go to quarantine about a week before you launch. And they're doing that to stabilize your health and make sure that you're okay and keep you away from anyone with germs. And the night before I was going to launch into space... Um, you know, they, they were planning what, the, what you wanted for dinner. And so earlier that day, one of the very nice uh, ladies who was one of the cooks there who ran the kitchen at the Kennedy Space Center said to me, what would, you know, what do you want to eat tonight? And uh, I was like, well, what do you got? And she grabs my hand and she says, honey, you are going to put your rear end on a rocket ship tomorrow and blast off into space. You can have anything you want tonight. And so to me, it was kind of like she was saying, this might very well indeed be your last meal. You can have anything you want. And so I ordered steak and lobster and all the trimmings for my uh, last meal before I launched into space. Hey, look, more lobster. Have you always been a risk taker or somebody who just was really passionate about things? Where does it come from wanting to have this kind of adventure? I, I am not a risk taker. Um, I am not. I, I, in fact, I I don't like heights. I've never done any skydiving. I have no intention of ever doing any skydiving. I, I drive very slowly in a car, and I'm generally very careful about things. But I've done very dangerous thing by flying into space and also spacewalking, which is dangerous. But that's because there was a reason to do it. I, I see the opportunity to go into space for me was a dream, a little boy dream. And I think that a dream is worth a risk. And I think that whatever you decide to do with your life, whatever one decides to do, they should feel that strongly about it. You should be that passionate about whatever you're doing, that you're willing to take risks. And um, I think it's kind of sad if whatever you're doing with your life is something you wouldn't be willing to take a risk for. I, I think you want to be doing something that you feel is that important. So I am not a risk taker. I think that helps actually being an astronaut because being careful is really important. And I think most astronauts are really careful. In fact, all of us are. And I think the, the reason we take those risks is because we're trying to do something that we think is really important. And flying in space and doing the experiments on the space station and fixing the Hubble Space Telescope, I think are worthwhile things. And, and putting people into space and doing it for our future, I think our future as a, as a species, as, as humans, is not going to be just here on Earth, but in space. And that, I think, is so important um, that it's worth risking my life for. has a new book out. It's called Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. And it's a tiny little book where you basically cover 14 billion years in about 200 pages. <laughs> I like to think of it as adorable rather than tiny. It <laughs> is adorable. It is. You could have a little golf pencil. Anything mini is cute. And so why did you want to write this book? I thought people needed it. A combination of people needing it and wanting it. Because you know, astrophysics just as a field, in total, it can be quite daunting. But meanwhile, nonetheless, headlines still come across anytime the universe flinches. And so there are words that you've heard before, even if you don't fully understand what's going on with them, such as exoplanet. You know, we've all heard that. A dark matter, dark energy, simulated universe, um, you know, big bang. You, you've heard all these terms before. And you don't have time to sit down and read a long, fat book. So what I wanted to do was curate 
a selection of mind-blowing content from the universe and offer that to the person who's in a hurry in such a way that they might sort of consummate their interest in the cosmos via this book. And why do you think it is so important for people to learn and know about science? I'm not going to tell you what you should think is important. I'm not going to do that. What I will say is, I'll I'll offer an if-then statement. If you do not bring some level of science literacy upon yourself, then you are disenfranchising yourself from participating in decisions that will matter in the 21st century for the survival of our species. We have decisions related to energy and climate and population and food and health, security. At the center of all of these huge issues is science. And if you do not know science, if you don't carry some science literacy with you, and you have to make decisions about how laws or money are are, are written or monies are allocated, then It's not really an informed democracy. We're just building houses of cards that we think are stable, and then as you get to the third level, it collapses. Now, as far as astrophysics goes, you know, does that help you, you know, balance your checkbook or whatever? You know, no, it doesn't. However, the cosmic perspective, which of course I saved for the last chapter, can be transformative to your outlook on yourself and your relationship to all flora and fauna on Earth, as well as to the rest of civilization. And you get that only by thinking about who and what we are in the context of the large-scale universe. And on that level, uh, astrophysics may be sort of the, the, the savior of our species. If enough people had this outlook, I, there'd be less fighting in the world. Egos would not be running rampant, and we'd be much more uh, helpful to one another knowing that we have a shared plight on this little speck we call Earth. Now, that would be the perfect way to end this interview, on a profound note. But your last meal is more about pizza than the profound. So let's end on the foods that Neil would bring with him if he was traveling to space. I would try to bring up my own damn freezer and load it with haagen and that's my food all the way to Mars. I I could live off of pepperoni pizza and ice cream. (laughs) <laughs> but it's actually ice cream and pizza highly nutritious it's got uh, high levels of, of, of fat carbohydrates and protein yeah i think about this all the time if i can only pick one food or two foods that i would have to eat every single day of my life what would it be and i say well let me do that on route to mars right that would be the way you do that and to be ice cream and pizza it'd have to be new york pizza the, the cardboard factor is very high in so many other pizzas out there it's interesting that your last meal is different than the food you'd want to eat every day for the rest of your life. <laughs> well, like I said, the mechanics of eating lobster was part of my answer. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Right. Oh, my God. The peanut butter chocolate haagen That is my favorite ice cream in the whole world. It is so creamy. It is ethereally good. Really? Peanut butter chocolate. Okay. So you're a Reese's, you're a Reese's person. Oh, yes, I am. I am a Reese's person, but this one doesn't have like the chunks in it. It's just the chocolate ice cream with the the ribbons of peanut butter running through it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. What would your flavor be? Uh, probably strawberry. Classic. Yeah. yeah, classic. I'm not complicated. Just when it comes to your brain and science, but, <laughs> but not with ice cream. <laughs> and that was Neil deGrasse Tyson's last meal. Make sure and pick up his new book, It's Adorable, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. And you can listen to his radio show. It's called Star Talk. Thanks to former NASA astronaut Mike Massimino for being on the show and for setting me straight about steak in space. Sure, there's steak in space. There Who is. I told you there's no steak in space. There's no crying in baseball either. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's memoir is called Spaceman, an astronaut's unlikely journey to unlock the secrets of the universe. I cannot wait to read this book. I've read a little bit of it. Yeah. And it's absolutely fantastic. If you're a fan of space or any of this stuff, it's a really great read. Sweet. Thanks to Barton Seaver for the lobster talk. Barton has a new book coming out soon. It's called American Seafood, Heritage, Culture, and Cookery from Sea to Shining Sea. Dang, dude. Everyone has a book feel like I need a book. We should write a book over here. This episode was produced by future authors Aaron Mason and me. Original music by Prom Queen. I'm Rachel Bell, and until next time, this is your last meal.
cool. Are you lamazing? Yes, from the 80s television. Uh, that is, I was going to say, I learned that from Full House. Me too. I don't even know if Lamaze was done outside of 80s sitcoms. Maybe not. Everybody was doing it. Everybody was doing it.